There's nothing wrong with using YouTube as a free archive for your church's sermons, but that's not what YouTube's algorithm wants. The good news, your church already has the video that it needs, we just have to tweak it. And there are four steps that you need to follow. We're gonna go through each one of those steps with real examples. And by the end of this video, you'll have the precise workflow needed to take your church's sermon, which is the result of the creative and spiritual effort that your senior leader has dedicated to studying scripture and prayerfully preparing the message. We're gonna be able to take that and publish it on YouTube to give that sermon another chance to reach and bless a ton of people. If you publish it as is, and this is what the vast majority of churches are doing right now, you're robbing it of that opportunity. Four steps to follow. Step number one, the title. Here's the bottom line. YouTube is a search engine. It's the second largest search engine in the world. It's owned by the largest search engine in the world, Google. This means your sermon title, Gravedigger, week one, March 17th, 2024, won't make for a good YouTube title, which is a shame because the message itself surely is rich with teaching and encouragement that would be beneficial to most people because we know the wisdom of scripture is applicable to all people of all cultures for all time. And yet we're burying that wisdom in a video with a title that is not relevant to most people. So. What does a good title look like? Well, recently I was working on a sermon for a church and the pastor had a typical structure to his message, three points. One of those points was dedicated to Judas and Jesus. And so I focused in on that section, gave it a good listen and realized that the pastor was emphasizing betrayal. So out of that came a new title I wrote, How to Handle Betrayal. And here's what that thumbnail ended up looking like for the new video. Now, be aware. This process of writing these titles, it likely won't come natural to you. It, it didn't come natural to me at least, but there's an exercise that I've developed that has helped me immensely and I'm confident it'll do the same for you. I call it the three C's because here's the thing. A good title does one thing especially well. It resides at the intersection of faith and culture, meaning it needs to make sense for people that know Jesus, but it needs to be just as accessible to folks that have no faith background whatsoever. And something that is becoming more and more common in the United States. I mean, just look at these religious graphs from Ryan Burge. The share of those with no religious affiliation is growing across every single generation in America. And for Gen Z, the generation coming of age right now that already accounts for one in five Americans, they're on pace this year to eclipse the 50% mark, where more than half will identify as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular. Bottom line, the landscape of faith in America and other Western nations, I'm in Canada, for example, is changing. And it's naive of us to think and assume that people will understand the lingo and insider terms of our religion when more and more people are growing up with no context for our faith's fundamentals. What has been historically true is not reflective of the current reality and future projections. The three C's exercise goes like this. You want to evaluate the title you've written on these three objectives, curiosity, common, and care. And the idea is to grade your title and give it a score out of five for each of the three C's for a total score out of 15. If you add up those scores and you've got a number greater than 10, awesome, move forward with that title. If it's lower than 10, consider rewriting it. And to help you with this evaluation, let's unpack these three C's a little more. First, curiosity. There needs to be an element of mystery to your title. You know, one mistake I see pretty often is churches writing their title almost like a thesis. You know, sometimes this can work, but unless the thesis is provocative on its own, spelling out the answer to the question is not a good way to stop the scroll and encourage people to engage with your content. You know, think about my title, How to Handle Betrayal. It's purposefully phrased in a way that matches the way that people use search engines. How to dot, dot, dot. And it's making a promise. If you watch this video, you are going to learn the answer to this question. So that's the first C, curiosity. Second C is common. The subject matter needs to be universally accessible. It needs to apply to anyone. So let's use a, a poor example this time. The secret to a worshipful heart. It's got the curiosity factor, sure. The secret, oh, what, what is it? But a worshipful heart? And that's insider church language that might mean something to you or I, but the average person, that's meaningless jargon. The final C is care. And this is the one I see churches mess up the most. I'll illustrate it with another poor example. How you can show gratitude even when you don't know how. Now, ah, okay, really good title structure, even when you don't know how, excellent. The problem, no one cares about practicing gratitude. And, and I'll pause here. We can all agree, gratitude is something we all need, true, but it's not top of mind for people going about their day. So it means that they're unlikely to stop scrolling when they see that title. Gratitude is where you want to lead people by the end of your video, but it makes for a poor starting point. What's a good starting point then? Finances. 
parenting, hope, uh, purpose, eternity, loneliness, anxiety, relationships, just to name a few, those are all deep issues that many, many people are having internal dialogue about on a daily basis, and they're problems that scripture speaks to. So, when your video meets people there, it's hitting something they care about. The three C's, curiosity, comment, and care. Practice writing titles through that lens and you'll grasp this skill quite quickly. I'm confident of that. And for illustration's sake, here's a list of titles on the screen that I would say score well above 10 on the scale of 15 for the three C's exercise. Pause and screenshot to read through. Save a copy for yourself. All right, step one is the title. Step two of preparing your sermon video for YouTube is the length. The average length of a first page YouTube video, according to Backlinko, is 14 minutes and 50 seconds. So what I like to do is extract a six to 20 minute focused section from the full sermon to create a new video of the ideal length. And this approach is actually pulled from the world of podcasting. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is take something from another industry, another culture, and, and bring it to the church world. Uh, because you know, it's easy to just copy what other churches are doing and then we all just end up doing the same thing as everyone else, getting out of our little bubble to see how other industries are innovating helps expose us to new creative ideas. So the thing about podcast conversations, as we all know, they can be pretty long, sometimes multiple hours in length. What producers will then do is timestamp certain sections that are focused on one topic and then pull those from the full conversation to publish as separate videos. And if you're looking for a church that models this, Let's look at Elevation Church. On their main channel, you'll find Stephen Furtick's full-length sermons. They then have a second channel, the Stephen Furtick dedicated channel, where you'll find sermon clips anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes in length. These are excerpts pulled from the message. And if you click into one of these videos, you'll find the full message linked in the description. Now, if you want, this second step is optional. If you can't dedicate the time to re-watching the full sermon to identify smaller clips within, you can skip this step. Just make sure to follow the other three. Which, of course, includes our next step, step three. This is the intro. Don't miss this part, it's crucial, because here's the thing. Viewers evaluate a YouTube video in the first 10 to 15 seconds, and it's those few seconds that ultimately determine whether they stay or go. So what we do is develop an attention-grabbing intro by stitching together compelling moments from the sermon. And here's what that looks like for the message excerpt we talked about earlier, how to handle betrayal. Most of us would have like taken that time to like twist the guy's leg off, right? That's what Jesus could have done at that moment. Have you ever thought about that? That to me, outside of the crucifixion, is the best demonstration of the love of God in scripture. We only get a glimpse of Jesus's interactions with his disciple. So a few key editing points I wanna to touch on here. Number one, we have big captions baked in full screen during this intro, why? Because videos on YouTube in 2024, both on mobile and desktop, autoplay in search without sound. And so users have actually begun evaluating whether or not to watch a video before even clicking into it. So those captions are essential to them being able to know what you're saying with the sound off. We also have the lower third of the pastor's name and church come in as soon as the intro is complete. That's us making our introductions. If you just discovered this video, you likely don't know who the pastor is or where they're from. So let's get you familiar. We also have an audio bed during the intro. Not any backing track though. We purposefully choose audio with a, a bit of an unresolved melody, a bit of tension, because the intro itself is a preview of the rest of the sermon to come. We don't want it to feel like a concluded thought and as for the value of this editing tactic, we recently did a podcast with the fastest growing church on YouTube. Here's what they had to say about it. When you watch one of our newer uh, videos, it will start out with a title or a clip from later on in the sermon, maybe an engaging or interesting part of that, and then it transitions into the full sermon. The reason that we do that is for a couple of things. One, watch time is a very important metric. The hooks that we're putting in what that does is it encourages somebody, it intrigues them to, oh, if I keep watching, we're going to get to this interesting bit of information. It also literally increases the watch time because they have to get through the teaser to get to the start of the video. And then also for search optimization, it gives you an opportunity when you're editing your sermons to be really specific about what the video, what you want YouTube to recognize the video for. You can find the full episode with Cornerstone Fellowship on our podcast YouTube channel, The Pro Church Tools Show. If you prefer to listen, it's of course on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This is a church that in 2019 started taking YouTube seriously for the first time. In four years, they went from zero to 100,000 subscribers. And in the last 10 months alone, they've added another 100,000 subscribers. 
You had likely never heard of this church before now, probably don't know their pastor's name. This approach does not just work for famous pastors and mega churches. And Cornerstone Fellowship is perhaps the best example of that. What started online for them is also making a big impact in person. It's all covered in their interview. It's linked on the screen and in the description. Okay, let's get to the final step in our four step process. Frankly, it's the most important step, the thumbnail. And I'll pause here briefly. If you're liking this video, would you mind hitting the thumbs up button? Really does make a difference. Takes you one click, appreciate it. Back to thumbnails. A good thumbnail is made up of three ingredients, text, color, and a photo of the speaker. I'd recommend pairing your church's colors, brand, font, and logo with a photo of your speaker to create a compelling thumbnail. That's the formula. It's timeless. You'll find a number of examples on the screen right from churches that we're working with. Now, what do you do if you don't have a photo of your pastor that's high quality? What if you've just got this live stream recording that, you know, it clears the bar for video quality, but it's not quite there for photo quality? Well, allow me to introduce you to a tool called Remini.ai. We use this every week. What it does is allow us to grab a still from a church's sermon, upload it, Polish it up in seconds to get it to photo quality where now we can use it in our thumbnail. Uh, this tool removes noise, compression artifacts, it even increases resolution. And if you're looking for thumbnail inspiration, you can make sure, check out Elevation, check out Cornerstone Fellowship, check out Life Church. They're all great examples and each does design a bit differently. And that's important because so long as you stay within the general formula that we just discussed, the creative expression should feel true to your church's DNA. And speaking of Life Church, uh, one of the questions we hear the most in the context of this approach to YouTube is, you know, where do my live streams go? Um, or where do my full sermons go if I'm gonna be creating these new videos that you're proposing? And we've already shown you Elevation's approach, right? They have two channels, one for Furtick, one for the church. Furtick gets the short videos, the church channel gets the full sermons. That's one option. Life Church models a different but equally viable approach where all the sermons are kept on one channel, but the full length services are kept in the live tab where the edited sermons go into the main video tab. Now, there's one more invaluable tool that I wanna show you. It's called thumbsup.tv. I use this every single week. It's basically a tool uh, to show you what your thumbnail and video title will look like once live on YouTube. So what I do is upload a thumbnail, add my title, and then browse through the different ways this will appear on the platform. And this is useful uh, just to make sure that my text isn't too small, uh, that it's readable even when the thumbnail gets shrunken down. It helps uh, show me where my title might get truncated if it's too long, and I can test uh, different thumbnails as well to get a feel for what I think might look better. Your church is already sitting on a gold mine of content for YouTube. You don't need to make new videos from scratch. Just four edits to your existing sermon videos will optimize them for YouTube, and this will dramatically increase the likelihood they reach more people and impact them with the gospel. I've shown you exactly what we do for churches that we work with every single week. If you want us to do it for you, I'll invite you to explore socialsermons.com. At the time of this writing and recording, we're at capacity. We're working with about 175 churches every week, so we're full, but you're welcome to book a discovery call with me on the site or join the waiting list. The YouTube video published on behalf of your church every single week is part of our complete plan, and you can see every package that we offer and all that is included in those packages at socialsermons.com. As for what you should watch next, check out my video titled Viral Church Social Media Posts. It comes with five done for you templates that you can download for free. It's linked on the screen right now. And thanks as always for your time, attention, and trust. We'll talk to you real soon.